Welcome. Thank you so much for joining the Building Apps track. I'm going to kick it off with a little bit of an opener. So thank you for joining. Uh, we have some of, the, I think, the brightest minds when it comes to content addressing and just building uh, new kinds of applications that really put a, a focus on user agency. And this, is, uh, this opener is going to actually echo a lot of what we heard in the uh, opening keynotes, which I think is a good sign. It's probably a sign that we're all tapping into the same uh, ideas. So a little bit about myself. My name is Daniel. I've been developing applications across the stack for about 15 years now. And over the last two years, I've been involved in IPFS as a developer advocate. So a lot of hand waving, as you can see. And in this, in this you know, journey through the Merkle forest, um, I want to explore some of the obstacles and the opportunities that I see um, to once again echo what has already been said. Uh, IPFS is a long-term project, and I think that uh, if we see it that way, then a lot of the frustrations and the obstacles that we face uh, become a lot more acceptable and palatable, and they're just part of our journey in, in, in making the web a bit better. So three parts to this, why IPFS, then the obstacles and the opportunities, and finally sum it up. So why IPFS when the why is clear, the how becomes a lot easier. And at its core, IPFS is all about content addressing. I'm going to put this This is all about content addressing, this idea that you address uh, content uh, data based on its contents using hashes. Now, IPFS is not the first content addressed system. We have Git. Um, Git has been around for a long time, and it is, as a content address system, it has enabled a lot of the innovation that we see around Git with you know, uh, different collaboration tools like GitHub, GitLab, and you know, even things like Radical that are built on top of uh, Git as a decentralized um, coordination mechanism for Git. So if you're a bit newer to IPFS, I think a good analogy for content addressing is uh, IKEA article numbers. So IKEA is uh, in, an international conglomerate at this point, and uh, you can use those same IKEA article numbers to order the same stool everywhere you go in the world, irrespective of which country or shop that you enter that article number is the same. Now, obviously, we're working with bits that have a zero marginal cost of replication. So moving bits around is a lot easier, and there's different problems that are involved with it. But I think it's a good way to think about the flexibility that content addressing gives you. Now, we, we, we say on the IPFS website that IPFS is open, verifiable, and resilient. But what about the user? So like has been said earlier, I think that an alternate way of looking at things is that IPFS should be for user agency because it puts people into the picture and really technology should be serving us as people. So uh, there's different ways to look at this and I think I already had an interesting discussion this morning about what is, what, what, how do we actually define user agency and how do we measure it? It's, it's a hard question to, to answer but in the context of IPFS I think these four points really matter to us. Um, the first one is data ownership. So when you have a SID, and as long as you have a provider for it, you have the right to replicate. And IPFS really enshrines that right to replicate. Of course, as long as you have a provider, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that exists in IPFS is that if you have a SID, you can magically retrieve it somehow through the magical network, but really you need to have servers and someone who's actually providing it. So that was the first one. The second one is censorship resistance. So the moment that you have multi-source retrieval, um, then uh, it becomes a lot harder to uh, censor. Um, you can do peer-to-peer -peer interactions, which uh, has a lot of power. I mean, I think most people using Git don't use that feature of Git, but having that possibility, I think, uh, creates the foundation for a lot of innovation um, and layered innovation, as I uh, gave the example with uh, the different platforms that are built on top of Git. And finally, privacy. Now, I put a question mark there because I think privacy remains an open question for how we solve that, especially in public networks. Now, centralization leads to walled gardens that provide no credible exit. Now, a lot of the platforms that we may be familiar with have already started providing 
thanks to legislation, legislation, a way for you to actually take away your data. The problem with things like data exports is that data export allows you to maybe take your data, but really all the value that you get, say, of something like Facebook or Twitter is your social graph. And the problem is that you may be able to take your data, but you can't really act on that data and really make use of those connections that you've built over time in that social graph. And so a good sort of alternate example of um, a platform or a protocol that uh, gives you the ability to switch providers is Blue Sky, where you can essentially take away all of your connections and still maintain those relationships, even if you change your PDS, which is the personal data server, the term that they use for those servers. Now, a lot of these ideas, I think there's like a great um, convergence that is happening in the broader software movement. This is, by the way, the reason why I uh, chose to rename this track from dApps to apps. I think we're all building apps and the degree to which that they're decentralized can vary and can vary significantly, but that's okay depending on the trade-offs that we make. I think the idea of putting users first brings us together with other movements um, in software that those include the local first movement and uh, the D-Web movement that, you know, have all sorts of ideals and principles that really, if you look at them, they focus on user agency and that is their common denominator. So I think we can learn and we can collaborate, especially if we see this as a long-term project in making the internet and software better for users. Now that brings me to the obstacles that I see that I've uh, sort of seen in my experiences over the last two years in this ecosystem. And I want this to be a constructive critique. Um, and in situations where certain set of trade-offs have been made, we can communicate that better. But I also hope that a lot of the, tra uh, the talks in this track can at least give you, if you're a developer or a builder, more clarity about what are those uh, inherent trade-offs and where the opportunities for improvement and what can these tools do for you. So I think the first one that is quite challenging is that going from file to seed isn't deterministic. There's good reasons for this. IPFS embraces optionality as part of its philosophy. And there's an inherent cost to that because if you have an image, you might end up with different SIDs. So that uh, beautiful image of a woman cooking up DAGs uh, can have different SIDs depending on whether you use raw leaves or not. Now, Kubo now has a new feature uh, called Profiles that allows you to essentially change the defaults of how files are merkelized when they're added to IPFS. Um, the approach that Iro took, I think, is also interesting, where they just chose a set of defaults, and the tyranny of defaults ensures that people don't face these challenges. But these challenges are real because if you have just a file, it's not enough for you in order to verify uh, its hash. You need the metadata. You essentially need the metadata the, that is in the DAG um, that makes up that SID, essentially. Now, another one is that it's not really clear what does it mean for an app to use IPFS or to use content addressing. And I think there's this like spectrum that I, it's pretty arbitrary, but I came up with, um, where on one end you just have a front end build that you just Merkleize using UnixFS, and then you know you you might pin it to a bunch of pinning services, and you call it a day. This is like the Uniswap case, or some of the front ends for the MakerDAO plat, um, uh, smart contracts. Um, and then you have like the deeper integrations that where you might use DAG JSON, um, you might use SIDs, and then you store those SIDs on a, a on a blockchain using smart contracts, uh, or you might link from data that is encoded as DAG JSON to uh, things that are happening on chain, like in the case of Snapshot that does off-chain voting. And finally, you have the approaches that are really like going all in on this stack and basically using IPLD, lib P2P, and essentially every user is a full-fledged lib P2P peer. And uh, of course, it's hard to not mention the Eierlegende Volmilsau. This is a mythical, this is a, a German term actually for a mythical creature that does everything, produces wool, uh, produces milk, lays egg, and of course you can um, eat its meat. And uh, the analogy here is that IPFS in its current form is doing so many different things that if you're a newcomer as a developer, 
It's like, what is this doing for me? Like, which problem is it exactly solving? Is it the wool or is it the milk? Now, this brings me to another challenge that I see uh, faced, which is how do you actually discover SIDS? SIDS are amazing, right? If you have a SIDS, you have different content routing uh, systems and uh, you know, you can uh, find providers for that seed and then retrieve that seed but, and verify it and, you know, we're living in like a la-la land. But the main problem is that most users are not using SIDS. And so they're using something that translates to SIDS. And if that thing is to be human friendly, you're either using DNS or you're using ENS. There's others that I've missed. Please let me know. I would love to be informed. Um, so trust can't be removed, only moved around. And the reason for that is that uh, DNS is still a trust-based system. Um, so you get human-friendly names, but they're not necessarily trustless. Can you, as a user, verify them? Um, I, I had a conversation last night about the degree to which DNSSEC helps with that, and I'm still not convinced, just based on the practical uh, ways that it's implemented that that can provide you know the verifiability that we would expect the same way that you can verify SIDS on client devices so ENS I think in theory is just because it's a blockchain based system might be the solution for that but um, in most situations I think if you're doing ENS resolution today, you're still relying on a lot of trusted responses that you might be getting from an RPC endpoint rather than actually doing a, a Merkle um, proof verification. Sure, there's a lot of progress, I think, around light clients, and we may see progress on that. But again, this is a long-term project, and these are the problems that we should be thinking about. Um, private data on a public network, this is a really, really tricky one. And I'm not even sure whether that's one that we should solve, um, at least in a public network. We can have an open discussion and an honest discussion, but I think some of the solutions that exist out there from my understanding are private swarms, and private swarms have a lot of drawbacks. They're TCP only, they do double encryption, and they just use a single symmetric key that if leaked, essentially you lose all of that privacy that you were expecting. Um, another one is Pyrgos, and we have Ian, uh, here in the back of the crowd, um, you can ask him. So, Piergos has actually worked uh, on implementing crypt trees, a way to essentially encrypt everything in a file system while giving the ability to share subsets of that file system. Um, they've also worked on block level access control in BitSwap. Um, and so, they've been thinking about how to do private data on a public network a lot. And of course, it's hard to not mention WinFS, the web native file system that has been championed by the fission team, um, which is very similar to what Pyrgos is doing. So I highly recommend you talk to Ian in the back here about Pyrgos. And um, I also look forward to learning more about uh, how we approach this problem. Now, two years ago, we had a lot of talk about the Cambrian explosion that we want to see in implementations. And we got that Cambrian explosion. We have a lot of different IPFS implementations now. Uh, not all of them are what we call IPFS mainnet. IPFS mainnet is a pretty recent meme just to refer to the Amino DHT and the whole Unix FS and the gateway part of, I think, the stack. Um, and the thing is that diversity and optionality are great, but they trade off interoperability. And in fact, I think what we see, just based on a pure look of, of, of history, that Cambrian explosions are actually followed by mass extinction events. Um, and so, for example, after the Cambrian explosion in the Permian, uh, a, at the end of the Permian period, roughly 95% loss of the uh, extant species at that time. Um, so, I think we can transpose this idea to the world of ideas of content addressing that we're operating in and accept that some experiments that we try out are just not going to work out. Finally, users are on ephemeral devices like mobiles, laptops, and browser peers just don't make up for good IPFS mainnet nodes, which are stateful and you know, resource hungry and require quite a lot of expertise to run. Now, I urge you to stick around for Lytle's talk about how we can do IPFS over HTTP um, 
as a way to sort of overcome some of these challenges by doing delegation and by relying on existing building blocks. Finally, IPFS on the web. This is a hard problem, and I think we're even just in the last year, if I look at all the progress we made with delegated routing, some of the transports work, and some of the bugs we've detected in some of the newer transports like web transport, I think they bring us closer to a vision in which you can essentially do multi-source peer-to-peer retrieval in browsers. Um, we're pretty close, and we're going to see some experiments and some of the developer tools to just debug how you even do these things um, later on um, when we hear from Alex. So with that, uh, I want to sort of sum up the talk. I think almost all apps rely on these foundations of state, identity, UI, distribution, uh, platform, and a network. And IPFS can play and content addressing can play a role in almost all parts um, of this. So if today we're on sort of this island that is quite colorful and has a lot of really cool idea, one of the big themes is broadening the tent and bringing uh, IPFS to the broader software community um, so that it can play an important role. And so I, I think the best days of IPFS um, are yet to come. And I imagine a future in which IPFS is interwoven into a broader software ecosystem that, of course, helps increase user agency.